Hi everybody. Let's make sure that we're getting all this sound fine. Let me know if let me know if you can hear everything fine. <clears throat> this is more of a um, test, to be honest. Um, making sure because I'm going to do quite a few of these live streams uh, while we're all in the lockdown. Uh, so uh, hopefully you're all staying safe out there, and um, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do any of the videos for a while, any of the proper ones anyway. I've got a white background here, kind of. I've got the wall behind me, but um, yeah, I'm just safe at home with the family. So uh, I thought I'd do a few more live streams to make up for it. So today I'm going to be talking about um, technique. Now I've noticed a lot of of new beginners to the instrument. So, uh, um, you know, there's, uh, I'm getting inundated with emails and, uh, and comments on all the YouTube videos and stuff. And it seems that because of all the, you know, because of all the coronavirus and that, loads and loads of people are, well, practicing or taking up the uh, bass. So um, I thought I'd do more of a beginner -y kind of lesson uh covering technique a, a few of the aspects of technique that you know everybody runs into problems with and uh i'll just wait for a few more people to arrive before i uh start doing it let me turn down the volume on the, on the laptop so it doesn't interfere what we got here um well 87 on that's pretty good so um yeah, so I've taken, I've brought most of my gear from the unit, because uh, I've got a little unit that's uh, a couple of miles away, and um, so I've got, uh, I've brought my mic, I brought my stand, and I've got the, uh, what else have I got? Well, I've obviously brought all my bases back, and uh, what else have I brought? Uh, well, I think that's it. So, uh, yeah, so I'll be doing a few live streams over the next coming uh weeks i mean who knows how long this is going to last uh so i'm going to be doing um uh, i'll probably do a few on the facebook study group i'll do some in the facebook uh, uh page i'll probably also do some instagram lives as well which i don't normally do Whoop. <laughs> and um i'll uh, yeah and i'll be doing these youtube live ones i've not done youtube ones for a while uh, there was a reason for that, actually, why I used to do a lot of the regular ones. And it's partly because the channels always suffer. Now, people like Rick Piata do pretty well with it. Uh, I mean, he does a fair few live streams, but he kind of is, is pretty clever with how he does it. You know, he, he puts a thumbnail in, he makes it look like a normal video. So he's, he's pretty good at doing it. Uh, so I'm going to try that with this. But I remember um, oh, a couple of years ago, um, I think it was Adam Neely, or I think both me and me, Adam and Scott Devine, we all chatted about a certain aspect of live streaming that was kind of bad for the channel. Because if you think about it, you get the, um, you know, you'll do a, a lesson and then the channel starts picking up and it does quite well. And if you and if your videos all start doing really well, YouTube uh, YouTube pushes it. The problem is with live streaming, you're never going to get that kind of um, uh, audience that you would with the normal videos. I mean, so, like I say, some people do it well, so they can kind of do that. But um, I was having much, much lower amounts, and it just started impacting on the uh, the way the algorithm pushed the channel. So, to some of you that were asking about that, about the uh, about why I didn't do as many YouTube streams, uh, that's partly it. Uh, so I do more of them over at the study group, which is for the um, that's the Facebook study group, which is for all the you uh, the talking base community. Um, so I'll just wait a couple more minutes while I just get the a few more. Oh, we've got 138 in, so that sounds like a pretty good amount. Cool. Okay, so I've made a note of like five things that I want to cover with this. So, um, actually, just before I do, let's check the comments. Uh, I'll I'll be around for probably mm, what is it going to be about half an hour, I guess, talking about these techniques. Then I'll do a little bit of Q and A, and then. Uh, and then I'll get off. Like I say, I'm going to do probably uh, quite a few of these over the coming weeks. Hi, Trevor. Hi, Steve. So we've got a few of the guys from the Facebook study group in, which is cool. Um, 
it's funny on YouTube you get so many more comments. Some good, some bad, obviously. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Uh, I'll be talking. Uh, I'm actually going to address the thing that you were asking about in the support group um, to do with the note duration. I'll be covering that in a second. So hang tight. Um, high difficulty with the positions of both thumbs. I'm going to be covering that too. New advanced slap lesson, please. Um, yeah, I did a, a double thumb uh, thing a couple of weeks ago, um, but over the next, uh, like today, I'm just going to be covering this beginner uh, technique kind of stuff. I say it's beginners, but I, I mean, I don't just mean beginner beginners. I mean, you know, beginner to intermediate, really, or or even, I mean, you know, you could have been playing 30 years and, you, <laughs> and there might be an aspect of it that uh, you've always had problems with, which I will cover, uh, or that I might cover. Um, but I'll do, I'll do a slap one over the next couple of live streams as well it's the isle of white a leper colony yet yeah. uh, almost it's uh it's pretty dead out there i think we used to have a leper colony on the uh isle of white i think i think it i think it was oh by the way i ju uh, some of you that follow me on facebook you might have uh seen last night i suddenly i didn't realize because i'm on the isle of Wight, which is just south of england for any of you that aren't from england it's a little island just off the bottom of england um i'm originally from wakefield or leeds um uh which is in the north of england but um my wife's from the isle of Wight, so i i'm now from the isle of Wight, and um that's where mark king's from as well he just lives about a mile that way um so yeah so we're um yeah, I'm, I'm looking around on Instagram, and somebody mentioned on one of my posts, um, he wondered if I was from Isle of Wight in Virginia, and I didn't realize there was an Isle of Wight county in Virginia, so I looked it up, and I thought, oh, great, there's an Isle of Wight there, but not only that, but there's also Smithfield, me being Mark Smith, there's Smithfield in the Isle of Wight county, and just to the side of it is Wakefield, which is where I'm originally from, but in England, so you've got all of those there so i said ah that's it because i've been, you know I, I keep talking about possibly moving to the states at some point and uh, i thought there we go that's where i'm moving to <laughs> it won't be any different to here right i there's going to be a ton of um comments in this so i better i better get on with the lesson um Oh, uh, yeah, before I start, I'm going to get a load of comments about it. Yeah, it's the Enfield Lionheart that I've got here. Uh, some of you will have seen this on, on my videos. Uh, Enfield, um, they're created by Martin Sims. Whenever you, I don't have them on this, but you know when you see guitars, be it Brian May, Keith Richards, you know, Mark King, all those different people. Uh, all those LEDs that you see down the, um, down the fretboard... That kind of comes from Martin. He's he's one of the the main guys that does that, and he's done it since the eighties, you know. And um, he, um, kind of, he he does a lot of paint jobs for um, basses and guitars, and he does a lot of that LED stuff. But he also creates bass guitars. He's a luthier, and he's uh, and he creates these pickups, which are the Sims Super Quad. So these are quad core pickups. So the bass itself is fab. It's like really. Um, I mean, a lot of people say it looks like a wall, but um, I suppose it does, it does in a way. But it's got this really cool paint job on it. So you can see there it kind of looks blue. And then if I move it to the side, it kind of looks brown. It's uh, copper and, I think, copper and navy blue. It has this weird effect. So it's really, really nice. It's um, It's got um, uh, quad core pickups and a Glock and Clang preamp in it. So it's got these LEDs on it. You see how they're green at the moment? Well, I can switch those. So that's red now and then blue. Green is single coil. Think jazz bass. Uh, red is precision. And then blue is dual coil. Think Stingray. Okay, so red is kind of more like a precision. So if I go and put the middle uh, pickup on. Okay, so that's more of a pre uh, precision.
So you can tell it's got that kind of precision vibe. Then if I go to green and then put it uh, in the middle, let's say. Now it's more like a jazz bass. And then for blue, let's say I put the back on blue and then put it to back. So that's more that's more like a, uh, a music man. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that's the bass. Uh, it's an Enfield Lionheart. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're really, really cool. What wound is it? it uh, these are round wound. So, um, so what I'll do is, uh, are they normal humbucker size? Um, I'm not sure, actually. They're pretty big. The thing I do like about them is that instead of having to have a ramp, uh, if you wanted to try four-finger picking and stuff... You, because they take up so much room, it's hard to get in shot with it. But let's say I put my leg up there. So if you're, if you, if you, whatever it is that you're doing, hold on, I'm still stuck on the other pickup. The um, uh, the pickups are great in that, you know, they, they act kind of like a ramp. Okay, so. So, um, I'll ignore the, the uh, comments for a little while while I do the lesson part. Um, let me just see how many we've got. Oh, we've got 221 watching now, so we're doing pretty well. You can tell the coronavirus lockdown has, uh, has improved the watch rates. <laughs> so, um, amp? No, I'm not using an amp. Uh, I'm just going direct into uh, a Yamaha AG06. Actually, just before I do start, I'll, I'll just mention, because loads of people are wanting to learn about live streaming and stuff, and obviously for all those guys that do YouTube and all that kind of thing, we're, we've been doing live streaming for years and years. So um, the way that I tend to do it um, here, um, I use, well, I'm actually going into a Zoom B3, but I'm not really using anything on it. I, I've actually got a... a an Ampeg B15 um, amp simulator kind of working in it, although it's not really doing... It doesn't really make... Th if, I, if I switch between it, so this is without. So you get a bit of that ticky ticky. So it's a bit trebly and a bit... Yeah, everybody knows that horrible direct sound. So if I put... Then if I kick in the B15... So here it is without. Now with. So that's on the Zoom B3. So the B3 is really cool for that. I normally use um, individual effects, but the B3, um, I, you know, I'm not that big a fan of effects, multi-effects boards, um, even though I used to have one for years and years and years that I used to use. I used to use a Boss. Um, I can't even remember which one it was. GT7B, I think it was. You know, the big red one. And... Um, yeah, so I, I go direct into a, into a Zoom B3, which then goes into a Yamaha AG06 mixer. It's a USB mixer. So I've got this mic. This is a Shure SM7B, which you'll see on, like, every podcast going. Um, they're, they're really good mics. Anybody that watches the Joe Rogan podcast, he uses one. Uh, you just see them all the time. So this and this are going direct into the Yamaha AG06. It goes straight into the USB, and then I use XSplit to broadcast to YouTube or Facebook or wherever it's going to be. So that way I can have this thing up there. And <laughs> That's not why I do it, but <laughs> the uh, you can do whatever you want with it. So you can put, like, transcription things on and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so yeah, so that's uh, a bit about the... Um, Oh, yeah, and just, actually, this is quite topical. Um, uh, Jay Pineda um, says, is way to deal breaker for you when bass shopping. It is. And this is really topical at the moment because, um, so, I used to, over there, I've got my um, Fender Jazz, the Marcus Miller signature. Now, they all come in different shapes, and well, not shapes, but different weights. Uh, you know, it's very hard to, um, no one bass is going to be, the same weight throughout the even with the same model or whatever they're all different um and my marcus miller signature is pretty heavy it's about 12 pounds it's 11 to 12 pounds and it's a pretty heavy bass now if you're only doing a gig 
couple of gigs at the weekend, something like that, you know, you can kind of get by with it. Um, but it, you know, the weight isn't going to be that bad. But, you know, I've talked about this before. When I used to do all those ship gigs that I used to do, I was doing sets every single day, you know, six, seven sets every, well, five to seven sets every day, every single day. And that could be for like three months, six months at a time. And it was like nine months out of the year, which I did for like several years. Uh, it was 10 years in all, actually. <laughs> so you can imagine it wore down my shoulder really badly. And um, I've had to have all kinds of things. Uh, I've, I, I had physio. I, it's a lot better now, but I had physio for ages and uh, sorted it out. I was having chiropractors look at it. I was having all kinds of stuff. Um, anyway, I sorted out that. So, I, you know, now whenever I go for a bass or if I go for amps and stuff, because um, that's as important for me as well. I'd love an SVT, 8B10, but... I don't, um, I don't want to be lugging that stuff around. I did enough gigs where I was carrying heavy gear around, and not just the the bass amp. You know, it'd be like, you know, if you're in a band, you're lugging the PA around and all that stuff. And you know, you'll do gigs where you're driving for, you know, two hundred miles or whatever. You get to the gig, you get out. What's the first thing you do? You don't do a warm up, do you? You get straight out. You start getting the gear out and have to get it in the gig. Um, and, you know, depending on the venue, you could be walking through kitchens, you know, you could be doing all kinds of things up staircases, you know, it's like a removal service, you know, it's like moving house. So, um, I don't like heavy gear anymore. I I've learned my lesson from all these problems. Anyway, I was looking on, uh, I, I was looking to get a new bass, a, a new jazz bass, because I've just recorded the chords for bass guitar series with that Marcus Miller that's over there. And it was starting to hurt again. I was like, I could, ugh, I don't need this. So um, I had a look for a decent jazz bass. And I was looking on the bass gallery's website, um, you know, what with all of this coronavirus thing going on. And so I bought a 75 reissue and it was down as 8.5 pounds. And I thought, oh man, that's amazing. You know, that's like brilliant. Because I've got like a precision. I've got an 82 precision and it's only about 8.7 uh, pounds. So uh, I know that that's a f great weight, you know. So I bought it. And anyway, it turned out that the website was slightly wrong. And it was actually 9.8 pounds, which is not super heavy. But I was going for a light bass. You know, when you've kind of, I always say it's like when you get your mouth ready for food. You know, like if you think that you're going to be having a certain thing for dinner and then it turns out that you can't have that thing for dinner <laughs> and you've been looking forward to it, your mouth's ready for it and you're like, oh God, no. So um, anyway, this bass turned up and I'm like, this isn't that light. And I weighed it and it was 9.8 pounds. So I'm sending it back tomorrow. The courier's coming uh, because they're still dealing with all that stuff. And I'm actually getting a 68 Jazz that is 8.2 pounds. So that's going to be arriving shortly. So uh, anyway, so that's all, to, you know, asking the question about is it a way to deal breaker? It was with that bass. <laughs> um, cool. Right. So I'll get on with, the, after all that, I'll get on with the lesson. Um, so let me just pull this across. So first things first. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do, I've just written them down, the, the five things I'm going to talk about. So we're going to be talking about stretching, about, I, I, I don't mean ah, stretching, I mean um, size of your stretch on the base. Loads of people, beginners especially, complain to me about not being able to make a big stretch on the base. Now, I'm quite fortunate, my hands aren't particularly small, um, I've got quite big palms. I don't have massively spindly long fingers, but I've got quite, but my hands are fairly big. So I can get a decent 7 to 12 um, stretch there. I could probably make 13 as well. Yeah, I can get about 7 to 13, which is a fair stretch. And obviously, after you've been playing a certain amount of time, your fingers do, they become more supple. There's no getting around that. They, they do develop that. You know, like if I put my hand next to somebody else's hand, generally their fingers don't stretch like mine. So my hands look really big next to some people's just because these fingers come out at the side. So that is worth bearing in mind. Anyway, the things I'm going to cover. Stretch, so that. Flappy fingers, you know, when people have got all this going on with the flappy fingers, we'll cover that. Muting, so that's a really important one. Uh, note duration, which um, Thomas, I was um, 
uh, he's been having lots of problems with this, which so I'll talk about that in a second. And um, finger strength. So first up, stretching, right? So um, or finger spam, right? Now it's important to know that just because you've got small hands doesn't mean that you're going to have to sit there doing this with your fingers, and it doesn't mean that you can't play bass. I know people... Uh, there's a bass player, actually, that I go to the pub with quite regular. Um, he's been a pro m since the 1950s. He's like, you know, and he's played thousands and thousands of gigs, right? Great bass player. And he's tiny. Like, he's tiny. He's probably about... How, how tall is he? About 5'2", five 5'3". Five and he's got small hands. And he has this big fender... Um, well, he's a bunch of basses. But... It can play great. It's not a problem. So I do have to say that to start. Don't worry about having to, you know, learning how to do all this and stuff. And, oh, I've got to stretch my fingers. You'll just injure yourself. Um, what's more important is learning about, about decent position shifting. So instead of concentrating on trying to make these, these kind of stretches. So if I'm, let's say that I did a, I don't know, um... Uh, I always use this as a good stretch one, uh, a, a two octave F major arpeggio. So so I'll, I'll just tell you what this is, and then you can try it, and then we'll look at some ways of getting around it, okay? So this is a, a big stretch line, right? So we're going to have F, first fret of the E string, A, fifth fret of the E string, C, third fret of the A string, F, third fret of the uh, D string, then A, 7th fret of the D string, C, 5th fret of the G string, and then up to the F at the 10th fret of the G string. Okay, so up and down. So that's that's a, a sort of big stretch um, fingering for a 2 octave F major. There's other ways of doing it, but that's just one way. Okay? So, on the face of it, that looks like a pretty big stretch, right? So, this is, like, the perfect example of how you can use uh, position shifts. So, what you want to do is, instead of trying to do this, you could try and do that. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I can get it, but it's not very comfortable. You know, I wouldn't want to be do, uh, stretching like that. You know, if you're on a gig, and, you, t you know, there's plenty of other things that you're going to be thinking about. You don't really want to be thinking about stretches with your fingers and stuff. They, they, you know, you want it to play music. You know, not, <laughs> not worry about the technicalities of all this stuff. So, really what you want to do is, let's say we take that F at the first fret of the A string, the E string. When you move for the A there at the fifth fret, shift the hand, right? That is way more important. So what you need to be able to do, though, is, and I'll be talking about this in a second, is note duration. You want to hold the note for the full duration. So you start on the F. So if you open your hand out a bit, don't worry about stretching it like this. Just open it up a bit and then make the move like this. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of using the thumb as a pivot. So, and this is another thing. I'll, I'll cover this in a second, the thumb. But... I'm kind of using that there so that I'm moving the thumb like this. So the thumb is like that when I'm here. Actually, it's, it's more straight across, actually. And then I just pivot it over to get the A. So I don't have to... I'm not having to move the thumb up and down the neck. I'm just pivoting slightly. See there, I'm not actually moving the thumb at all. It's just... It's anchored. But I'm just doing this. Just get used to doing that. One, two, three... Four, one, two, three, four. Make sure that you can hold that note for the full duration. Again, it's something I'll be talking about in a second. One, two, three, four. Now, then you've got the C and the F there, so you just check those with the first finger. So, third fret of the uh, A string and D string. And then again, we're up here. So now you can pivot again with the thumb to go from the F to the A. Third fret to the seventh fret. And then we'll put the C here, and then again. Look at that. I'm pivoting. I'm not moving the thumb. I'm in the same position. I have to move 
you know, th there are position shifts involved. You know, I do that, and then I come up here, and then I move. I I, gra I very progressively move up. So thumbs there, shift again, shift again. But when I'm actually playing things on the same string, there, I'm just pivoting, right? Now the other thing that you need to know is um, to do with the thumb. So if you've got your thumb over here, you're not going to be able to stretch very much at all. So let's let's ignore position shifting now. Let's actually look at optimizing your finger size. So if you're trying to play, let's say that we're trying to play 7th fret to the 12th fret, right? Or, or, all right, let's make it a bit small. Let's go 7th fret to the 11th fret, okay? So you're trying to play this major third pattern. Now, some people might have problems with that. What you don't want to do is put your thumb over here. Now, there are times when you want to put your thumb over there. Okay, so all that kind of stuff. So, you, you know, then you'll bring the thumb over for muting purposes and stuff like that. So your thumb can come over. It's just that, you know, there's no one size fits all for anything sort of technically on, on an instrument. It's like, you know, you, you just have to find the right technique for the thing that you're playing. Let the music itself dictate what you're going to do rather than the other way around. Trying to, you know, fit everything into this uh, technical mold that you that you know that you've created for yourself. So, so we've got E to the F sharp there, seventh fret to the eleventh fret. So make sure that the thumb is right round here. The more round here that it is towards this side, the wider the stretch is going to be. Then you also want to get those fingers more parallel with the frets. So instead of it being like this, you want it more like this. So you might actually want to kind of use that second finger as a bit of a gauge and kind of see that as a... Uh, oh. <laughs> know what you're all thinking um as a kind of gauge across there so that that's more um parallel with the frets so you get this kind of effect now another thing that you're going to want to do if you want to optimize your stretch is kind of go more flat handed okay so some people um talk about having curled fingers you know like this right which i'll cover in a second Yes, you need to have curled fingers. There is a, a reason why you would want curled fingers. But when you're trying to do a big stretch, or if you're trying to do different things with muting, you'll want to go flat fingered, right? Now, I'll show you why. If you do this with your hand, right? Now, that, I would say, is the optimum stretch. I've stretched out the fingers completely, okay? So you can see there that we've got a fair stretch between the first finger and the fourth finger. Now, watch what happens when I curl them over it gets smaller. Look at the difference between that. Look at me with my deformed <laughs> stretch there. So, ooh, 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 auto focus. So, when I do this, it goes smaller, bigger, okay? So, that makes a big, big difference. So, when you're going for something like that, can you see I've got my fingers flat? If I was curled over, the, the most I could stretch, I could probably get it. But, but if I go flat fingered, I get even more. So I can get 7 to 13 on the G string with a flat hand. Not very usable, though. I mean, it... Uh, <laughs> but with curled, pretty much 7 to 11, practically. I have to stretch out a little bit for the 12. Now, like I said, you don't necessarily want to want to be trying that stretch, but that's another... Just that, that curled finger versus flat fingered makes a big dig difference. So you've got to get that thumb over, use pivots, and stretch those fingers, you know, flat fingered, okay, if you want to get a bigger stretch, okay? So that is the, um, that's optimizing your stretch, uh, and also position shifts. Like I said, you know, people always think that you need to be able to use big stretches to play all these things, you know, if you take that, that uh, as, a, as an example. But you don't. Um, anybody, I've mentioned it before, but... Um, oh, what's he called? Um, blah, 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 blah. Did the damn... <laughs> um, uh, he teaches bass at uh, Berkeley College. He always uses that technique. I did the damn lesson material for him for SBL. Uh, Thingy Morris. Ah, I can't remember his name now. Um, is it Danny Morris? Danny Mo Morris. Danny Mo Morris. So anyway, he does a lot of playing, as does uh, Rocco Prestia from Tower of Power, a lot of stuff where they're playing with one finger and then they use the other fingers to mute.
mm. you know, that kind of playing, right? So if you do that, you're going to have to play with one finger a lot. And you just watch Danny Moe play. He can play all over the neck with one finger. You could, if, if you've got good position, you can still play all those things. You don't have to do this. You can play with one finger. It's not, you know, perfect, <laughs> you know, but... Okay, so I'm just playing with one finger there. And like I say, it's not perfect, but it just shows you don't have to be able to do that. You know, there's a middle ground. So don't worry about having small hands. Yeah, Russell's just said Danny Mo Morris. Yep, that's that's it. So uh, so that's, that's optimizing your stretch, okay? So the other thing, uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about is the flappy fingers, okay? So you know what I'm talking about. So you start playing something. Let's say that you're playing a major scale, okay? You get this kind of, this is an exaggeration, by the way, <laughs> but you get this kind of thing going on where it's all over the place, all over the place. So there's an easy fix for that, right? Uh, now, before I give you the easy fix, the reason that I know about this easy fix is because I used to know a guy at music college. Um, I won't mention names, even though it's not that I'm saying anything bad about him because he was great. Uh, but he was one of the fastest guitarists that I've ever seen in my life. Um ridiculously you know just all over the place and just, just complete shredder i was in a band with him for a while just crazy right and um he used to play these licks where his hand would just it didn't look like he was playing individual notes it literally looked like his hand was doing this right so it was so he'd be getting like 30 odd notes just like in a fraction of a second just and I'm like, how are you doing that anyway i there were some other guitarists that had got a bit more of this flappy kind of finger thing, but he never did. It just was always like this. And the key to not having that flappy finger is just curling the fingers. It's, it's as simple as that. So if you're playing a C major scale, if, if you don't think of curled fingers and you just go flat fingers like that, you, you end up having to move the fingers a lot more because they're doing this. Now, remember what I said before, flat fingers are good for stretches, but when you're playing a scalar lines, in more intricate like, like lines, right? The, you're better going for curled fingers. So if I then curl them, right? And, and you'll need to actually bring the hand round a little bit to do this because you'll find that the fourth finger doesn't really want to get over to the E string. So what you need to do is pivot the hand round so that it's kind of this, so that think of this, pinky has been quite parallel with the frets maybe even more over this way so curl them over and can you see and you want to be very light with the fingers as light as you can okay see that so so that's just a major scale right so all i'm doing is curling the fingers over you know if i took a d minor scale now even if you've got tiny hands and you can't get one finger per fret don't worry about it you just use the thumb pivot to, to come up and down but you can still avoid the flappy fingers my old bass teacher when i was at um, university he used to put a book above my hand so if we would he'd, he'd give me these classical pieces to learn every week and then when we were playing them he'd put a book because he saw that i'd always got this flappy finger thing and i, I didn't think it was that bad but he used to put like a book over it so it'd be like this and then if i was getting <laughs> so if he say nope 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 less movement less movement I mean, oh. so uh, so yeah, that's how to get rid of the flappy finger thing. So next up, uh, muting, right? Now, muting, uh, when I say muting, I'm talking about getting rid. I, I don't mean muting like that kind of muting or that kind of muting. I mean uh, avoiding residual noise. So when I play, if I just play, I'm not going to put my thumb on anything. I'm just going to pick the G string and then let go and you'll hear this noise afterwards. 
woo, woo, woo. So what happens is because of the vibrations, you obviously get the... I mean, if I was to do this, you know, it, it, I mean, or even just... The vibrations just get those strings moving, right? So even small amounts will cause these uh, strings to vibrate. So you always have to be aware of muting the unused strings, right? Um, most of you that have been playing for a certain amount of time will know this pretty well, but it's something that beginners don't know about, and it's why you can end up with a messy sound. So um, there's two ways to look at this. You've got right hand and left hand muting. So um, right, but right hand muting, in terms of the picking hand, that all comes from the thumb, okay? Uh, and then for the left, if you're finger picking, if you're playing with a pick, it's going to be in the this part of the hand. But um, in terms of the left hand muting, first of all, um, there's a uh, many of you will have seen me talk about this. There's something that I call the home position, and uh, you know I talk about this a lot. <laughs> and there is, you know, I just named it the home position just because I wanted a name for it. But it's just something that if you know you watch any. Um, professional bass players, and they all do this. It's just something they all do. And it's not something that you are taught usually. It's just something that happens over a period of time because you're trying to lock down all this noise. So I would say that if you're going to be going for this home position, let's say that I'm going to be, well, we don't have to worry about what we're playing because let's say we're going to play an open E string, right? So depending on what I might be playing afterwards would be where, uh, determine what kind of uh, position I put the hand. But what I want you to do is take the first finger there and just lay it lightly across the strings. So just dead weight on them. We're not pushing down on them at all. We're just holding it against the strings. And what will happen, I'm doing this around the fifth fret. What will happen is that you'll probably get harmonics if you're over a node. If you're not, you'll just... So that sounds quite cool, doesn't it? <laughs> There's an old Commodore 64 game that's got a that's got some music. I think it's called Fairlight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to look that up later. Uh, anyway, so we've got that, and then what you want to do is then bring these fingers down, uh, second, third, and fourth fingers. So now it's just dead, right? Okay, maybe. A got a little bit of harmonic there, but that's dead. So if you were wanting to play ghost notes, this is what you want. Okay, so wherever I play on there, I'm getting ghost notes, okay? So that is a safe position. I can bash this thing all I want, and I ain't going to get any bangy noises. I'm not going to get residual noises. So that is our safe position. Now, what you can do from there is, is allow the notes through. So if I'm going to play the D there at the fifth fret of the A string, I can get into the home position, first of all. And then I just raise these fingers and press this finger down. Okay? Then when I want to cut it off, I go back to the home position. Okay? Simple as that. Doesn't matter which finger I want to play with, because if I play with the fourth finger there, I can just hold it down. You know, I'm in this position, and then I just hold the finger down, and then back to the home position. And you want a muscle memory for that home position. So you want to know that that, you know, if I, if I just go like that, that's the home position. You don't want to be thinking, okay, I've played the note, now I've got to put this finger back here and these fingers here. No, you just want a muscle memory for doing that, okay? So, if I'm playing an open E string, these fingers become the muting and the, uh, the choking of the note. Okay, but while I'm doing that, Everything else is locked down. This finger and these fingers are locking down these upper strings so that we're not getting any noises, right? Okay? Now, bear in mind that when you're doing this, if you're going to be playing... When you're playing like that, you're going to be a lot more flat-fingered. You know, you're not going to be curled all the time. But if you're playing standard bass lines... You know, that home position, you can see me there. I'm, I've got it. I start with that position and allow the note through. So I'm coming from a, 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 
a starting point of silence as opposed to, okay, I've not got any hands on the bass and then I'm going to find the note and then I'm going to play the note and then I'm going to take the finger off and then, you know, none of that. I'm locked down all the time. And this technique is essential when you're playing slap bass. It just so happens that when you're trying to do all that, you know, all the uh, percussive kind of stuff, going to be in that position anyway but the good thing about this is that when you're you you're locking it all down you know when i'm when i'm playing a slap line there i don't have to worry about all this because that finger there is locking them down if you just watch what my hand does when i'm playing that kind of stuff it's it's all just that home position, I'm there. And it's a very, very clean technique as well. So you, you can see there that it, I'm not really moving around a lot. There's none of this going on. You know, it's, it's just very, very simple. Just, you know, it's there. It's the home position. You're locked down and, you know, there's no noise, right? Now, the other side of the coin, or bass is this hand. So you've got the thumb here, and this can do a lot of the muting as well. The combination of both hands is what you really want. And like I, like I, I said before, you know, for that, you know, I'm actually cutting the note off with the thumb. You can actually use this thumb to mute that low E. So it's, you know, any anything goes really when you're moving onto these higher strings. But um, <clears throat> the thumb on this hand, is how you take care of a lot of the uh, residual noise um, when you're playing lines. Because like I said, this is good for bass lines, where it's like single notes. It, you know, it is fine. I mean, it's okay for lines. But if it's something like a scale, you can't really be coming out with, you know, all this kind of muting stuff in between. You've got to find a way to to stop the noise on the strings below because this um uh, home position is good for muting the string that's in that effect and also the strings above kind of you know the higher pitch strings but when you're wanting to mute these lower strings that's where the thumb comes in so that's where anchoring your thumb comes in so if if i'm playing on the e string i'll just have the thumb on the pickup if i move on to the a string i could still play on the uh depending on what I'm playing. I could still stay on the pickup, but then as you move across, you want to get used to... I mean, hold on. Let me try and get the... Oh, let me try and get it so you can see it a bit better. Watch my thumb. I'll just play a C major scale. So... Just, just working up to the G. So I start on that pickup, and then, then I move on to the E string as I'm coming up. Then again, when I get up onto the D string. Now, once you get to the D string, on a four string bass, that is, you you don't really have to worry about moving onto the D string. On a five string bass, you would. But on a four string bass, you can kind of get away with having the thumb on the A string as your highest kind of move. Because when you play rest stroke and the finger comes back onto the next string, it's actually, in effect, choking off that string. So when I play that E there, I'm playing the E ninth fret of the G string. So I'm playing the G string, basically. I've got the thumb on the A string there. And when I bring the thumb back, that finger, when it rests on the D string, it's cutting it off. It's muting it. So I don't have to worry about the D string as much. And the problem with actually moving the thumb to the D string is if, I'm, if I've just got it sat there, you'll get more noise from the A string. The key to getting around that with things like a five string is to use floating thumb technique where you actually shift across like this with... So that you kind of move across like this. Uh, so that's floating some thumb technique. And if you really want to study that, I would uh, definitely advise checking out Todd Johnson. I did an interview with him here on Talking Bass last year. Um, go check out to uh, Todd Johnson. I mean, there's a bunch of guys that use floating thumb technique, but uh, he's uh, and, and Gary Willis. Uh, so both of those guys are huge advocates of floating thumb technique, and it comes in really, really handy when you're on five string bass or six string bass or seven string bass or nine string bass. 
get that back a bit. So that's uh, that's muting. So use this hand, use that kind of home position, bit of thumb if you need to, and then make sure that you're tracking where you're moving with the thumb on this hand. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, not too bad. So um, two more things. So note duration. Now this is something that Thomas was asking me about from the study group, and I'm hopefully still here. Um, so he was working through a walking bass line that I had for Autumn Leaves that was on one of the website, uh, uh, sorry, on, on YouTube. Uh, and I think um, the line, the opening of the line was something. It, I mean, that's basically the, uh, the chords there. Uh, but uh, he was, when he was walking up with it, it, there was this cutoff. And I was trying to explain to him that when you're playing, especially stuff like walking lines, you want um, full note duration. So if I just play round and round on that single chord vamp there, so I'm just playing up and down there. As you work through these notes, each one of them. Okay, each one of them leads into the next, okay? So, each one of those notes play it and then wait for the next note okay you don't want this this is this is what you don't want okay so this is an exaggeration but you can okay you know you don't want that you you know you don't want gaps in between you want straight into the next note and the only way to get around this really is to just focus on doing it actually you just have to wait to make the move until the the next beat okay now some people might say okay well you can do this by just keeping each note held down as you go and yeah that is something that would help but you don't have to you can I can use the worst technique in the world, like this. I can do that and it will still, I can still wait for the next note. So one thing you could do is, let's again take something like a C major scale, considering this is a beginner lesson, and then you just work up through it and maybe take uh, each note for two beats. So one, two, three, four, one, two, Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, listen to what's happening there. There are no gaps. I'm not bringing this finger down and certainly not taking this finger off until that next beat. One, two, that's when we pick and we bring the finger down. And we certainly don't take the finger off. Okay, so one, two, three, four. When I say we don't take the finger off, we don't take the finger off before that. Okay, so you can take the finger off as you do it. Like I said, you could use the worst technique in the world ever. And you'd still be able to do it. But one, two, three, four. Full duration. And I see this in so many people when they start playing bass, uh, where you tell them to play something, and then you see this kind of obsession with playing the note, obsession with, with, with playing the next note. You know, it's like, I've got the note, now I'm looking at the next note and figuring out where I'm going to go, and, you know, taking the finger off and then thinking, okay, now I need that one, okay, and now I need that one, like... You know, you're, you're just dealing with the attack. You're just dealing with the actual fretting of the note. And that's not what you want at all. You want to keep that note down until the next one. Unless you don't. 
right? You want complete control of that. So you also want to be able to play this. You know, you want to be able to create the gaps. If you want to, you should be in control of it. The problem is, is if you can only do that, you know, you want to be able to do this. He says scuffing up the, the position shift. So each one of those notes, ba 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 ba, they've all got to move into each other. You don't want ba 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 ba. You know, you don't want daylight in between them. So uh, that is just. I mean, I'm. I say practice it. You you can practice it, but it's more an awareness. You just need an awareness of it. Um, the more that you're aware of it, the easier you'll probably find to do it. I, <laughs> you know, when people go uh, doing video like. When I first started doing videos, you end up going um all the time. It's, it's, you know, everybody knows about this. If anybody that has to do public speaking or anything like that, and I'll still do it from time to time, but I'm not as bad as I was uh, like that. So, um, so that hesitation, you're filling up the dead air with a um, and um, there it goes. So when I first started doing videos, I was doing it all the time and the way to get around that is to just be aware of it. So, you know, and I, I was reading up on stuff. I was doing my head in that I kept doing it. So uh, it turned out that the way to get better at that is to just be aware of it and just kind of tell yourself off every time you do it. I've got to say, there is a, a little element of it that once you become more kind of, well, confident, you know, and you've done it for a while, the errs and everything aren't as bad because you're not you're not worried about having dead air. You're not worried about about it about the about the whole thing, and so you 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 just don't seem to do it as much. But I consider these these you know this this kind of thing as the same kind of thing. You just need to be aware of it. You know, just waiting to put those notes down. Don't worry about that next note. You know. Don't worry about the fretting of that next note. You go, you'll be fine. You'll get it, <laughs> right? And even if you don't think you do that, check it out. Try try playing something. Try playing a you know a, a bass a, well a scale, and see what happens. It's it's frightening how many times I have students and they do that. It it, it seems to be everybody. So um. Yeah, that's uh, that's note duration. And then finally, finger strength. Now, this is another thing that people seem to always be obsessed with about getting, oh, I've got to build up my finger strength. I've got to sit there doing these practice. You know, I'm going to be sat there doing all this, uh, um, I don't know, these technical exercises. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this over and over again until my finger strength improves. And really, you don't have to worry about that. I would say that the most important thing for anybody as a beginner is to just learn as many songs as you possibly can. Just learn bass lines to songs and play along to records. Just do that. And you will find that your finger strength improves anyway, right? It's To be honest, I, there is an element of finger strength and dexterity but it's not as much as you would think. It's not like you build these huge muscles up in your hands. It's, it's not like that. You, f you technically get better. And yeah, your stamina does improve a little bit as the ligaments and the tendons all become more supple and you, you know. But a lot of it is just, is more technique it's, and finding leverage in things. Um, you, you know, as you're playing across something, you, you just don't have to use the same amount of, of energy as you think you do. Like, if you were to play a note, right? So I'm playing a C there, third fret of the A string. If you were to play a C like that, you'll be amazed at how little you actually have to push it down. But everybody gets so used to locking the hands down. If you were to just take your finger off and then just hold it against that C, that third fret, at first you'll just get a, a harmonic. Now I'm hardly pushing down, but what, watch, watch what happens as I start to push down more and more. It starts to turn into this rattle. Don't, now, don't pick too hard. The more you, the harder you pick, the more you will have to push down. But just average picking, and you'll find that that's not being held down that hard at all. And if I push, 
hard, really hard, all that happens is that, well, I mean, there's no there's no point in holding down really hard. You you'll find that you're slower. You won't be able to play fast, right? Um, your stamina will decrease exponentially. I mean, it just becomes so. Uh, your hands just become so tight, especially if you're on a gig. And this is one of the problems. This is why people sometimes find that when they're in the bedroom playing and then they go to doing a live gig, all of a sudden they don't have the stamina that they would have had before. Or they, they you know, they tense up and the hands, they come off stage going, oh man, my hands, are they, got, they got blisters where they didn't have blisters, all these kind of things. And it's because you're either playing harder than you would have or you're holding down harder than you would have because of that kind of uh, adrenaline and, you know, you might have nerves. There might be all kinds of things that happen. Eventually, you know, if you've been playing live for any amount of time, that just disappears anyway. You don't care. But, you know, when you first start out, you might be holding down really hard. So just become more aware of playing lighter you know i you know if i'm playing without an amp i know that i end up playing a lot harder picking wise you know something where i'm going something like that i might be play, picking really hard when i'm uh, if i'm unamplified but when i'm through an amplifier it, I, I just play a lot lighter in general like just playing standard root notes I am basically tickling the string. But if I'm playing unamplified, I'm more likely to pay, play like this. But, but when you can hear everything well, you just, you hardly have to touch the strings. So, you know, having a decent amp that's got enough power for the gig, that can make a huge difference. Number of times that I've been underpowered on stage, I've come off, I've got blisters on my fingers, and I'm like, how the hell did that happen? And it just happened that I was slightly too quiet. You know, I was slightly underpowered. And because I was slightly underpowered, I was compensating it. You know, I didn't even realize I was doing it. I'm just overcompensating by picking a little bit too hard. And then you come off stage and you've got blisters. You know, blood blisters, you know. <laughs> and that's just from having, you know, not uh, being underpowered. You know. Anyway, so... That's uh, five beginner's tips for uh, uh, technique. Five beginner technique tips for bass. So uh, hopefully you've all enjoyed that. Now I'm guessing I've just got this vast backlog of comments. So I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning because I'll be here all night. Um, so let me just go up a little bit. And then I'll try and um, answer anything that uh, you want to ask. I'll be around for the next five, ten minutes. Of course, now I'm doing this from home. We'll be putting the kids to bed and all of that stuff, so I have to do all of the home stuff while I'm here. This is our front bedroom, actually, that I mean. Look, I've got the white background. It's almost, it's almost like the videos. If I didn't have that the light switch over there and a radiator down there. Um, anybody that saw my uh, Fender Rumble image on Instagram and with the... Um, radiator it's that radiator the rumbles there <laughs> slap it a base he says mark uses minotaur straps that's the 4.5 strap actually this one's not a minotaur i do have minotaur straps i've got them i've got <laughs> i've brought my bases back because i didn't want them over at the unit um so i've got like a bunch of them over there and i've got a couple over there those have all got minotaur straps on which are really good cheap alternatives to the Levy's uh, or Levy's leathers. I think I think that's how you pronounce it. This is a Levy's leathers one. These are expensive. Um, the uh, they can cost anywhere up to about 130 bucks uh, for it. And this is the 4.5 inch strap. They are amazing though. I mean, they feel so nice. They're nicely padded underneath. Perfect padding. Um, and really wide. Remember what I was saying earlier on about heavy bases and all of that kind of stuff? A nice wide leather strap will help a lot with alleviating the problems there. So, uh, yeah, Minotaur straps, uh, they're great. They're more like 30 to 40, uh, 30 to 40 bucks, maybe 50 bucks for, a, for some of them. But they're nice big leather straps. You can get 4.5 inch straps. I always look four and a half inch straps. And, um, yeah, they come in all shapes and sizes. But they're really good um, for the price. I would still, if I could afford it for every one of them, I'd have these. But, I mean, it's, you know, 130, 150 bucks for every single base that you get. It's a bit bit much for a strap, isn't it? 
But because I like this bass so much, I thought I'd put this one on. <laughs> and also, I don't use uh, strap locks. I use these uh, little washers that you can get off uh, Grolsch bottle tops, which work out great. I used to use strap locks all the time, but I found that uh, one of the reasons that I stopped using them was because of doing the videos, actually. I used to uh, get squeaks and things out of them while I was recording, which, you know, when you've got a Lavalier mic on, just, ugh, it's terrible. Um, ba -ba -ba. Hey, Mark, you don't have an extra roll of toilet paper around there, do you? Um, we've got a few. Luckily, I'd got a bunch at the unit because they were sold out around here, so I brought a blood back from my place. Especially when you've got kids like ours that... They love using toilet paper. Russell says, My pinky's short on both of my hands, so I've learned to make really quick jumps. Yeah. If you've got tiny fingers and tiny hands, position shifts and pivoting is the way to go. Does how high you are wearing the base impact the hand position and how far you can stretch? Looks like a base, uh, looks like the base is in your lap. If standing, would it be different? No, I have it set so that it's exactly the same whether I'm stood or not. And I have it down the middle. Now, this is important with the... Um, well, it's not important. <laughs> it is for me. Uh, I have the base on my left lap, right? Instead of on the right lap. I might sometimes have it like that. But most of the time I'm like this, you know, like classical or Spanish guitar style. Now, the reason for that is uh, that... A, I do have the strap set so that it's exactly the same whether I stand up or sit down because I, I don't want it to feel different when I'm stood up. You know, I generally stand on gigs and I don't want to get used to playing something while I'm sat down and it feel completely different. Call me OCD, but I don't like it. So, um, so yeah, so I've got the bass like this because, think about it, if I now stand up, that's the position for it. If I've got it side on like this, I mean, some people might stand like that. I've seen look, people stand in all kinds of ways. But I like to stand like that. Now, one thing that is um, important when it comes to getting a bigger stretch is actually raising the neck a little. Uh, you'll find that uh, br bringing the elbow in and then uh, raising the neck makes it a little bit easier for doing stretches like that. So... Like that, you just have to get round more. But if it's like this, you, you don't have to move your body much. I mean, I move my body in all kinds of ways, depending on what the line is. You know, you know, like, for weird chords. I mean, whatever works for whatever it is you're playing, you know. What do you think of fret wraps? Uh, that's Eugene. Um, yeah, I, I have used them. I used to use a, you know sock around uh, the neck when I was a younger uh, and then I just stopped tapping to be honest I do a bit of it here and there you've probably seen the addicted you know all that stuff that I did on the video a couple of a couple of videos back um, and I can't remember whether I used a fret wrap for that I think I did uh, the thing that fret wraps do is it gets rid of all of the, the I say it's residual noise you kind of get these weird kind of harmonic -y kind of things like it's all bangy. So there's me playing a G at the 12th fret. Hear how much nicer that is. And it stops all the residual noise on the lower strings. So when I'm playing... So if you're doing something like that, you can have all this weird noise. You know, it's easy to get like... going on underneath it. So... Uh, fret wraps get rid of that but i think it's better to practice without them so that the you know they are cool and they, they you know they're great for getting rid of all that noise but if you can avoid that noise if you if you become too reliant on them then you can kind of make a problem for yourself because what if you don't have the fret wraps so um i try not to use them unless i really have to um Buster says, for what it's worth, that's an SBL strap, I do believe. No, it's not. It it does look a bit like one. I know that the, is it the one strap that he has um, is uh, has got this kind of insignia, but I think it's an SBL one. 
Um, no, I've not got any of the SBL ones. Um, I do. <laughs> I remember Scott. Uh, I know the whole story about all of that, how it all got started as well. Me and Scott were having a curry when he first was doing the, uh, you know, getting it, getting it out there. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't mind one actually. I don't, I don't know where to get them. I think you can get them. I'm guessing that you can that you can just buy them in on random. I don't know if they do them on Amazon. I'm guessing you can get uh, maybe he's, maybe the runs finished of them. I'll ask him, but I wouldn't mind if they look really cool actually, and um, I suppose they're quite expensive. But then again, so are these Levis leathers ones. But um, I think I've I think I have used one, not on one of my bases, but I played through some of Scott's bases, and I think he had one of the straps on at the time. On one of his, on, uh, you know, one of the overwater, I think it was the overwater, like, Fender Jazz one. I think. Anyway, so uh, that's the, uh, so it's not an SBL strap. Can you recommend some nice melodic bass line to learn for tapping? Not really beginner, but, uh, um... I don't really do much tapping anymore. I need to learn some tapping pieces. I used to know loads of them, but I, I don't know any of them anymore. Uh, what you can do is take things like chords, and then you can kind of mess around with them. So if I take something like a, I don't know, like an E-Power chord, right? So <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can mess around with them by tapping the notes up here. So I've got this here. So the notes up there are... So you can just kind of make these nice little patterns up. So if you fret just, I mean, that's just a power chord, just a E, B, and E. So 7th fret A string and then 9th fret on the D and the G string. And then take the notes of the octave up here. And then you can just try moving around. So if you were to take the top line there, depending on whether it's major or minor. You just improvise around it. So just messing around. You know, etc. Uh, there's loads of things you can do with that. Take a bar chord. Which you'll you'll know that kind of sound from NV four three three four five, the Billy Sheehan thing. That's where I started uh, where, where I kinda of get that from. But that's a nice melodic way of putting tapping into stuff. You know, if you were to finish a song and then, you, you know, you kind of finished on that and, you know, you can just kind of do whatever you want by, you know, melodically working around the uh, the scale, the key. Uh, Tom says, string action for beginner, rather high or rather low? Uh, well, just middle. Um... I wouldn't go too low because you're going to get buzz. I wouldn't go too high because it's going to be hard on your fingers. You want the, you want to aim for just a medium ground. You know, the, the most important thing is to get your uh, the neck relief right. You know, so when you if you were to hold your if you hold down the first fret of your let's say your A string, first fret, hold that down, put your elbow pretty much at the end of the neck, and then roughly around the ninth or tenth fret, then just press down on the A string, and you'll be able to feel where how much. You've got to, I mean, I actually need to change this. I've got too much relief in it at the moment. Um, but basically, they always say that you want to have to be able to just get a credit card through there. So you want it, you want a bit of relief, but not too much. So it's the bow in the neck. Because when you take a string, if you think about it, at that end and that end, think about a skipping rope. It's, it's a lot tauter at both ends, right? So it the uh, most amount of vibration is going to be in the dead middle, right? So you've got it tight here, and then it comes out like this, like an ellipse, right? So in the center of the, of the string, so depending on where you're holding it, that is going to be the widest amount of vibration. So because of that, you want a little bit of relief in the neck to allow for that extra bit of vibration. The harder you pick the more of relief, uh, more relief you're going to need. 
You know, you can't circumvent the laws, uh, laws of physics, Captain. You know, if you're going to pick hard, you're going to need more relief. Otherwise, you're going to get tons of fret balls. So uh, if you pick really light, you can get away with having a pretty flat neck. Um, it all depends on what kind of player you are. So I would say get your relief right. And then from based on that, then you set your action, you know, to what the, the, the action is. You do that after setting your relief. you got to get your relief right first, because if you don't get that right, then you can try doing whatever the hell you want with your uh, action, and you're just going to run into problems like buzz. You know, you'll be thinking, why is it buzzing? And, you know, no matter how high I put the action, you know, stuff like that. And then you do your intonation after that. So that's the length of the string uh, with the screwdriver at the end, and that will make sure that that is the same pitch as that. Um, because otherwise, if you're playing up here, it's going to be out of tune with what you played down there. Right, so I'll just be another few minutes. I'll just take a few more questions here. Let me just blast down through what we've got. Uh, how many people have we got, by the way? Let's have a look. Mm, 234. It's, it's pretty good, isn't it? Um, so, I'll go right down to the bottom and then just come up a bit. Um, who would win in a cage fight? You or Scott? <laughs> I don't know. We both uh, did karate when we were kids. I know that much. And his brother, I think it was, was a um, was pretty high up. Um, and I've done bits of kickboxing and boxing as well. So I don't know. And I've done a bit of jujitsu. Not not a lot. I put my neck out doing it. Next to my unit, actually, is uh, they do jujitsu there. So I was. Uh, I just got started and pff, had to stop because my neck, I blew my neck out. Um, but I might be starting Muay Thai. I'm a massive boxing fan, by the way. I've been a boxing historian since the like early 90s or whatever. I used to have like <laughs> about 200 videos, you know, VHS videos just with all these old fights on. I just used to collect them. I used to, you know, buy, I used to get all the boxing magazines and then I'd, I'd buy different uh, VHS collections. You could specify which fights you want. So I'd be getting like, all right, okay, I want this Sugar Ray Robinson fight, and I want the, you know, I just go back through them all, getting all these fights. So, like, I'm a pretty big uh, box of bad. I don't know what would happen in a, in a cage fight. <laughs> Scott is old and weak. I'm older than Scott. I think I'm two years older than him, or th maybe three years older than him. I'm 45 now. Um, sorry, no, I'm 45 this year. What am I talking about? I'm 45 in June. Uh, I think Scott's 42. I know I'm older. What's the minimum... This is Fighting Bear. What's the minimum amount of wattage a gigging bass player should uh, use for, have for his amp? That completely depends on what kind of gig um, and different wattages on different amps translate volume-wise completely differently to change... I mean, that's, that's a really different... Uh, difficult question to answer i think if i was to give you like a rough guide i'd just say get as much power as you can if you're going to be gigging if you're going to be doing lots of gigs and you want it to be able to handle most gigs i'd say in between it's really tough because i've had 400 watt amps that just don't put out much but then again i've had three 200 watt amps that have done that have been much louder um, I used to have a 1600 watt power amp in a rack, so it was 1600 watts, and I had 1200 watts on tap on the speakers. Um, I just had a separate power amp in there, because I got sick of having underpowered amps, so I just got a full-on power amp, and then I had a separate Glock and Clang preamp, so I used to carry this massive rack around with me, and um, that was more than enough power for anything, so if you get 1000 watts, it's, it's usually going to be pretty good. It all depends on what the band is as well. If you're playing a light restaurant gig in a jazz trio, you could get away with 200 watts, to be honest. If you're playing in a metal band, like I used to play in a metal band with two guitarists that had got like Marshall stacks, and good luck. <laughs> good luck cutting through that noise. <laughs> you know, double bass drums. You know, and it was, you know, I could barely hear anything. And everything that you play ends up being doubled with the guitarists anyway. So, you know, so it, uh, it, it, that's a really tough one. 
Uh, how do you find out what key a song is in, and what's the difference between a key and a scale? A key is uh, is basically the there's a certain amount of tonal gravity that you get in a key. So, as an example, I'm going to demonstrate what key is by just doing this. If I'm in the key of C major, right, and I just play the chords C, F, G, and C. Okay, so I'm coming to rest on that C. Now, remember what I said about tonal gravity, that kind of coming to rest. That C is our tonic chord. It's, the, it's chord one. It's our home chord. The key revolves around that, right? So if you're in a major key, it's going to be... It's going to use the major scale as the palette of notes around that, that tonic. About the, the, that's where your tonal gravity is. And then if it's a minor key, you're going to use an assortment of minor keys but you can do that with i mean when you play modally if you write modally modal compositions they're not classed as keys necessarily but in effect they actually are you are kind of creating a key with let's say a dorian or a mixolydian because you still do have that tonal gravity uh, but i won't get into that too much but basically the scale of the is the palette of notes that are used to generate that feeling of key right so if I'm in the key of C major, I use the C major scale, right? That's the diatonic palette. You can use other notes in there as well, chromatic notes. There's, you know, most songs do. Uh, but that's your diatonic set, the, the, the notes that work, <laughs> right? I'm saying work because there's a bunch of caveats in there, chromatic caveats, so to speak. Uh... What's the best bass tuner for me at home? What, the best? As in, you want the, the absolute best? Well, it just so happens, I can't reach them, but over there I've got like a bunch of tuners that I'm using for a tuner shootout that I'll be doing soon. Uh, I think the best tuner on the market is the Peterson Strobo Stomp HD. It's amazing. Um, it's about 130 quid, so it's pretty expensive, but it's amazing. I love it. Either that or the... Um, uh what's it called i've got it as well uh the um what the hell's it called i can't remember the name of it now it's the one that everybody the one before the strobo stomp that everybody used to like hold on oh, i can't see it i can't remember the name of it now anyway there's another one that's really good but they absolutely wipe the floor with all the things like polytune Cog Pitch Black. I've used the Cog, Cog Pitch Black for years and years and years uh, for gigs. And that strobo stomp just <laughs> wipes the floor with it. Um, you know, the Boss uh, Tuner, all of them. I've done a comparison of, of them. I'm going to be putting out a video at some point um, working through them. And I've got to say, the strobo stomp is so good. The only problem with that strobo stomp, I would say, is that it's uh, a little bit delicate. Um I say delicate because, you know, things like the Boss tuners and stuff like that, the TU3 and all those, they're like built like tanks. You could, I could throw them, I could throw them off a cliff and they'd still be fine. But that thing, it's very classy, the Strobo Stomp. So it's got a kind of glass front. It's a little bit like taking an iPad on a gig. You know, you're thinking, hold on, this thing's going to get smashed. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit like that. Um, but for home use, Brilliant. And I would definitely recommend it for setting intonation. Uh, I'm a big fan of that strobo stomp. It's a strobe tuner, but it is absolutely perfect in terms of its accuracy. It's amazing. And like I said, polytune and all that stuff, forget it. That strobo stomp wipes the floor with it. If you don't need it to be absolutely pinpoint accurate, then you can get anything, to be honest. <laughs> the only one I don't like is the Behringer, to be honest. Um, I tested them, and it just uh, couldn't even find the low B on the on the um, on a five string. Snark clip, yep, they're cool as well. You know, if you don't need absolute accuracy, then I mean these will do fine. You know, you just turn that thing on and. Pop it on, and then away we go. I'm out of tune. That's a good point. I didn't tune up before I did this. 
but it's oh, it's so funny looking at it when you've been used to the strobe tuners because they're so accurate. Whereas this thing, <laughs> it's like you could move it quite a bit and you'd and it'd stay on the on the middle, you know, as you as you're playing it. I can I've moved that quite a bit and and it's it's hardly moved. I mean, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying that it's a bad tuner, but when you said the best tuner, then that Strobo Stomp is, uh, in my opinion, the, the best on the market. Uh, I better get down to the bottom. Uh, I'll just come up a little bit. Um, How to play major chords. I've got the, by the way, while you're all here, um, I've got a sale on over at Talking Bass. Completely forgot about that. So because I've had a bunch of people new to the site, um, I thought I'll put on a sale because, you know, people are seeing the courses and it's like, woo, courses. Um, so I've put on a 30% discount just for this week. So if you've been looking to get any of those courses like the site reading, the slap course, the... Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Chord tone, essentials, scales, da, 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 da. Um, the, the beginner's course, all of that stuff. There's 30% discount on all of those. Um, also, um, most of you that follow me know that I'm working on the chord, uh, chords for bass guitar course. Everything's pretty much done. I've just finished the lesson material. I've been hard at it. I've just written about, I've written 140 pages in the last two weeks. So I've just been hammering it, trying to get that thing done. Um, so the lesson material is done now. I just need to put all the web pages up, which means transferring all of that information up onto the website. So that's going to take me about another week. So once that's done, I'll be releasing the chords course. And the chords course, unlike the chord tone essentials, chord tone essentials course, which I've already got out, is all about arpeggios and learning about how to use them in bass lines and everything else, and learning arpeggios across the whole neck. Um, the chords for bass guitar that I've got coming out is chords proper chords you know so all of that stuff and there are tons and tons of things to learn in it so it's it's three modules and uh, we go into I do a breakdown of and I loved her by the uh, and I love her by the Beatles. Um, so we start with just playing the melody and the chords, and then gradually put the melody on top. But first, we just do it with a bass with a standard with simple bass line, just with the root notes. Oops. just a bass ju that's just a bass note and the melody and then oops so then we, we fill it all in but that's in the third module so the first module is all about just double stops thirds tenths whoops you know oops you know that kind of thing that's a tenth uh power chords power chords <laughs> and all the different variations on those inversions all of that then second module it's all about triads seventh chords uh third module it does get into added note chords like you know all of this stuff six chords um and then into the arranging a, co a, uh, a chordal arrangement, uh, sorry, a solo chordal arrangement. So I get into all of that. So it's a pretty big course, um, and I will have it out in the next two weeks. So if you're looking to um, get into that, I would definitely recommend, if you don't have a membership over at, uh, the free membership, that is, a free membership over at Talking Bass, because that signs you up for the email list. So if you go sign up for a free membership over there if you don't have one already you'll be on the email list and then when it comes out you'll get the uh, you'll get the email so um 
Right, last couple of questions because we'll be putting the kids to bed very shortly. Um, who else we got in? Hi, Diego. We've got people from everywhere here, haven't we? Um, what hand finger reach exercise do you recommend? Well, I, I don't, like I said earlier on, I don't really have any, I don't think exercises for, for stretches is, is, is even a thing. I don't, I don't think you should sit there trying to stretch your fingers out. Just play standard bass lines and, in doing that, as you as the dexterity improves on your fingers and your technique develops, so that you get used to these kind of position shifts, you, for one thing, you'll realize that you don't need a big stretch. Every now and then, there's something that's nuts, you know, like in Portrait of Tracy when he does the, you know, that crazy stretch that he's got there that everybody <laughs> finds hard because Jacko had massive hands. But he gets this harmonic by playing the second, uh, he frets the second fret and then plays the harmonic at the sixth fret. So that, that's, a, that's terrible. It's sort of <laughs> awful to play. But the, you know, you sometimes get these, that, that kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but apart from those, I mean, they're, in general, pop songs, metal songs, country songs, jazz songs, whatever it is. You ain't gonna be doing that. You you don't ah, you know you know you're not gonna be doing all this. So don't worry about it. Just learn songs and just get used to moving your fingers around. Just you know mo using position shifts, using pivots, in order to just develop the dexterity and the subtlety of your fingers. And then gradually you'll find that your fingers just actually do stretch out a little bit. Anyway, but it takes time. Russell says, I'm messing around with spread trides and their inversions because I can't leave the house. Yeah, I mean, uh, anybody that wants to learn about arpeggios and chord construction principles, because after all, an arpeggio is is a chord played one note at a time. So, there's a C major. So. So, that's a C major, well, that wasn't all a C major, but that's a C major uh, a triad. So if you're playing over a C major chord, you can use those notes to create a bass line and create something a little bit more melodic. Are you suffering from your work being shut down? Not at the moment because I've just moved everything back to the back home. Um, but because um, everything's online, I'm, I'm not suffering that much from it yet. I think the problem's going to come later down the line uh, when everybody's flat broke. At the moment, everybody's making the most of the fact that they're not getting out there. So, you know, people are still buying courses. Still, you know, all of that stuff's still running fine. But I am fully aware that later on in this year, we're going to be into for one hell of a recession. That's when it'll kick in. For some people, it's kicking in now, you know. But I think for a lot of people, it's going to kick in later. <laughs> this is a great time for lazy people to finally learn music theory. Uh, right, I'm just jumping down to the bottom because, like I say, I'll be go. Uh, it's 28 minutes past six, so I'll be going in two minutes. So I'll just whatever there is at the end of it, I will just uh, I'll just check out. So I'll answer a couple more questions. Uh, ba ba ba. God, man, I'm burning up with these headphones on. How do you deal with volume while playing soft alternating with the slapping in the same song? Um, well, from a technique standpoint, you just have to be caught. Uh, you can kind of deal with that a little bit by just not hitting the <laughs> string as hard, but a compressor will is your friend in that um you know, in that setting. So you can go from something like that to, to slap and you can keep the same the same volume. That's what a compressor is for. So I would recommend a compressor. There's, there's very specific reasons for having a compressor. Because some people say, oh, why do I need a compressor? Or do I need a compressor? And it's like, no, nobody needs a compressor necessarily. You get it for a job. You know, you, you it's a tool for doing a certain thing, just as choruses. You know, you, you don't buy a chorus and think, oh, okay, well, I'm going to put chorus on everything. It's a tool for a particular sound. A compressor 
isn't forgetting a sound per se, even though it does actually have an effect on your tone. It's more for uh, it's for evening out all the transients and even well, just evening out everything. So loud becomes quiet, quiet becomes loud. You put everything down the middle, um, which you might not want to do if you're trying to play expressively. You know, if you if you want to do this, if you just want to play an arpeggio, over the, I mean, that's just a simple example. You know, to be able to go from quiet to loud, playing with dynamics, you don't want a compressor to be, you know, in the chain because you just <laughs> it, all of a sudden it's going to be everything's going to be bob 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 bob. But if you're playing, I mean, I try to play as even as I can anyway. So. I used to practice that when I was a kid, just making sure every note is bum, 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 bum. So I, I don't need a compressor as much, but a comp that's what a compressor does, basically. It evens out the attacks. So um, if you're trying to play with a lot of dynamics, you don't want a compressor in there necessarily. You can with a very small amount, uh, smaller ratio on it, I suppose, and change your threshold. But, you know... That's a big subject is compression. It's not something I'm an expert in by any stretch of the imagination. But, uh, you know, um, a compressor is perfect for you in that setting, wanting to switch between fingerstyle and slap. Right, so, like I said, last couple of uh, questions. Uh, could you write the names of the tuners, please? Um Strobo Stomp. It's Peterson. It's a Peterson Strobo Stomp HD. Just found your channel. I have to get my first bass. If I progress with my wife, uh, we'll have you to thank. Oh, <laughs> I thought you'd put something else then. <sighs> uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm releasing a video about tuners soon enough. Uh, I might have to do it from here. Uh, who knows? Cool. All right, then. So it looks like that's about it. So, so uh, I am going to be doing more live streams. So... Um, yeah, I'll be, uh, this is um, the one that I've done instead of the Friday video, obviously. But I'm probably going to start doing quite a few more live streams um, from day to day. I'll probably do some Instagram live. If any of you don't follow me on Instagram, go check that out. I'm over at uh, Talking Bass Lessons on Instagram. So I just put random stuff up uh, now and then. And um, yeah, so I'll be doing that. I'll be doing more of these YouTube live streams and I'll be doing more uh Facebook ones as well, so just keep an eye out. Like I say, if you're not uh, on uh, talking, if you're not a member of the Talking Base site, as in the free membership that is, uh, sign up and you'll be able to get emails about you know all the news on everything. I've got the chords for bass guitars uh, course coming out within the next two weeks, and we've currently got a sale on over at Talking Base. So if you're looking to get into reading or um, any of that stuff, ear training, any of the stuff that I do in any of the courses, then go check it out. The reading course is kind of my flagship, to be honest. That's the one. If you want to learn how to read music, that's the that's the one. I keep trying to push it more and more because everybody that does that course, it's almost like a epiphany for them. As soon as they do it, they're like, "Oh my god, I can't believe I've never done this before." And uh, because it's a it is a, a pathway to learning how to read, a, a very easy kind of pathway to it. And I and it goes from absolute basics, absolute beginner basics, not being able to read anything through to advanced so and it's massive you know there are hours and hours there's a, i think i've got about 15 16 hours with the video content on it there's about 500 pages of 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 examples in there it's crazy big right it will keep you going for the next three years uh minimum so that's like a lot of practice stuff you can get from that so that's the reading course i would say if you want to try any of my courses out that's the one to try you'll be you'll know every single note on the neck within a certain amount of time, you know, just from reading. And you'll also know so much more about rhythm and you'll just be able to read. So it's a, um, yeah, I can't, I can't push it enough. I know it's one of my products and it's one of the things that I'm pushing, but you know, in terms of an educational standpoint, in terms of tips for things, because I, I you know, I'm quite quick to, 
push other people's products as well. I'm not, you know, it's not like I'm going to go, oh no, I don't want you to buy that. Like I, I always talk about Stuart Clayton's books. I think his books are brilliant. I think he's like the 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 new kind of Ed Friedland. You know, like Ed's always been the guy. You know, when it comes to books and stuff, uh, and he still is. He's brilliant. Um, but Stuart Clayton is uh, fantastic. All of his books are amazing. Um, I love them all. Uh, so yeah, and you know, I'll push other things. But I do think that the uh, that the sight reading course that I've done that's my pride and joy, really. Um, so yeah. Oh yeah, Alex says there. I'm also an audio engineer. Mixing and mastering and over compression is just as bad, if not worse, than no compression. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's so it, you know. It, you can get such a, a tone suck or you get that just horrible effect from uh, over compressing things. And uh, let's face it, you get a lot of that in modern music. <laughs> There's so much stuff that just ends up sounding so over compressed. But it's really easy to over compress your bass as well if you're not careful. Especially given if you, like some compressors are very subtle. You can buy a compressor and it's like you don't even realize that it's actually doing anything. And they're pretty good. But if you get something that's like if you get a rack mount compressor or something with a lot of controls on them, you've really got to be careful because you you then have it in your, you you know, you have the control then to be able to really do some damage. <laughs> Tips for absolute beginners, says Mark. Um, if you watched the video earlier on, I've got five big tips for technique all about, uh, you know, for bass. I don't know if you saw those bits, but uh, that's that's the main, you know, crux, crux of the biscuit. Cool. All right, then, everybody. Great to see you all. Um, and uh, not that I saw you, but you, you saw me. Um, so... Uh, I'll get going and uh, I will probably see you within the next few days. So if you've not seen me over at Instagram, go check me over at Instagram because I will probably do some Instagram lives as well. So that's uh, something to go check out. And there's also, for any of you, I know that a lot of you don't do Facebook, but if you do do Facebook um, and you're not a Talking Bass customer, you can go to the Talking Bass group. There's actually a Talking Bass group. So you can go check. There's a Talking Bass study group, which is for people that have bought courses. It's like the support group. And then there's the Talking Bass group, okay, which is like, you know, like there's the No Trouble group and there's the SBL group and there's all that. So um, go check that out. And, uh, oh, yeah, MXR Bass Compressor. The compressor I use is an MX uh, M87. So that's a, that's a cool compressor. Cool. All right, then, everybody. I, uh, I'm terrible at goodbyes and I just waffle on. All right, then, everybody. Nice to see you all. And I uh, stay safe and I'll see you all later.